Thanks for the wonder of the season, the gifts of color and the transformation that is all around us. We give you thanks for opportunities such as this morning, opportunities for learning and growth and new insight and wisdom and a fuller and ima imagination. We give you thanks for all those gathered online or in the classroom here today. And we give you thanks for Edith Humphrey's presence here and the research and reflection and learning that she has been able to engage in and share with us. And on this morning, we pause and we take time to pray. We pray for all those who have a song they cannot sing. We pray for all those who have a burden they cannot bear. We pray for all those who live in chains they cannot break. For those who are sick and for those who tend them. For those who are misunderstood and for those who misunderstand. For all of us, O oh God, teach us the vocabulary to convey your care in words and in actions. Loving God, the care of each person is in your hands. May your reconciling and transforming grace be known to us, through us, or even in spite of us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dr. Edith Humphrey is the William Orr Professor Emerita of New Testament at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. She earned her doctorate at McGill University in Montreal, for which she received the Governor General's Gold Medal before taking her position in Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, before taking her position in Pittsburgh, sorry, she taught in uh, several colleges and universities in Canada, including Augustine College in Ottawa, where she also served as a dean for a year. She is the author of numerous articles and nine books on topics as diverse as apocalypses and worship and Christian spirituality and human sexuality and C.S. Lewis. And currently she is working on a book about teaching Paul's doctrine of justification through the eyes of the church fathers. Her most recent book, Beyond the White Fence, is a novel for middle school children in which six young people travel in time and space to meet the saints for which they are named, which sounds like an absolutely delightful book. Dr. Humphrey is not only a scholar, she's also a musician, but I, I won't go into details about that. She has been part of the uh, earliest Christian formation that happened in the Salvation Army here in Winnipeg, where she was in Winnipeg for some time. Um, she has been active in the Anglican Communion for about 25 years, and she's also now part of the Orthodox Church for the past 12 years. She is married to her husband, Chris, for 46 years. She is a mother of three daughters and sons-in-law, grandmother to 20 grandchildren. And since her retirement in January 2021, she has continued to teach in various milieu, write and speak frequently at Christian and academic contexts. So Dr. Humphrey, we're delighted that you are with us and we're looking forward to hearing you speak to us about mediation inside and outside the household of God. Again, there will be time for questions later, so take your notes. We'll have questions available via the chat or online, and we welcome uh, you to share your questions. Dr. Humphrey, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Duick. I really um, do regret not being able to be with you in person, home in my native land, although I feel very much an American after being here for almost 20 years. And uh, it's really good to be with you. Um, we're going to continue the material that we looked at yesterday. And so I'll begin just simply by giving a wee bit of a recap. Uh, last night, we saw that Christians acknowledge and rejoice in one God who himself, in the person of the Son, Jesus, is our one mediator. Perhaps the greatest mystery about this incomparably and utterly other God is that he has assumed or taken up humanity to himself, becoming one with us. Divine greatness is seen in divine humility. 
it can both be said then that he will not give his glory to another and that he wills to share his glory with those of us who participate in this fellowship and in his fellowship. In this session, we're going to concentrate upon the wonder of prayer as Jesus taught it, and about the particular gift of intercession given to the family of God. But as a first step in considering how we can share with him in this kind of mediating prayer, let's firmly establish his absolute uniqueness, the otherness of God as a firm foundation for human mediation. Those who participate in the communion of Christ may expect to share in some of his characteristics, including the action of mediation or standing between God and others. But just stop and think about this. First, let's remember that how God prepared the human race to understand his coming among us. It's only in the context of strict monotheistic Judaism that the astonishment of the incarnation could be rightly understood when the gospel was preached. Pagans, so accustomed to hearing about the commingling of gods with humans, would need to be catechized first about there only being one true God before they could receive the doctrine of the incarnation as the miracle that it really is. And so today, Mormons diminish the marvel of the God-man by teaching that all of us are by nature gods and need only to realize our potential. Mormonism's counterpart, in some ways in the ancient world, the Gnostic movement, also glorified the spiritual. Their special category of so-called pneumaticoi, spiritual ones, meant that the uniqueness of Jesus could not be maintained in their varied writings. I'm reminded of the amusing but telling story of Henry James, an early 20th century philosopher who was accused of not accepting the divinity of Jesus. His retort was, I deny the divinity of Jesus, I do not deny the divinity of any man. But Jews and Christians do indeed deny the divinity of humanity so far as our nature is concerned. The stories of Genesis make it very clear that we are created and not autonomous or self-ruled. In fact, in the earliest centuries, Christians recited creeds that stressed the resurrection, but not the immortality of the soul, because in Greek philosophical circles, that phrase meant eternal life stretching out in both directions in time, and therefore implying a human soul that had already and always existed. They wanted to distinguish God as the source and humanity as derived. Without that distinction, the incarnation would be met with a kind of ho-hum response, not with apt amazement. I actually think that our humble origin is not instinctive to fallen humans. I remember when I was very young, how I was outraged when I first learned that my parents had a life before I was around. How dare they? The habits and the, the pride of a child is amusing, but instructive. We need to think soberly. And when we do, we will be amazed at even the most common trait of the Christian, the fact that we pray. After all, God is, by definition, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. Why should our puny efforts make any difference? He doesn't need our energies. He is perfectly informed about all circumstances, and he will always do what is just and right. Some Christians have suggested on this basis that prayer is simply bringing our wills into alignment with God. But this is not how Jesus describes prayer. Our sovereign God, the Lord Jesus, describes this human action as effective, as something used by God, as do the apostolic witnesses of the New Testament. Prayer is not only an exercise for our spiritual growth, though that is important, but something powerful and active upon the world around us. Remember the Lord's prayer itself. Certainly that prayer has other very important elements besides petition. It does have adoration and praise and acknowledgement of God's power, but it has a request for forgiveness. And many would say that the first three elements are in some ways higher and more significant for our becoming like him than petition is, for they approach God without demanding anything in return. 
When we give thanks and we adore, we simply delight to be in God's company. But asking for 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 this forgiveness, our petition, our confession, and our intercession are also humble activities that recognize the grandeur of God as well as our human need. Indeed, one can envisage God smiling at the ridiculousness of any one of us who consistently prays as though all we wanted were to enjoy his company. Actually, we know, and he knows that we are riddled with ailments and with fears. He knows when I am putting on airs and pretending to be more holy than I really am. The Lord's prayer, then, is refreshingly realistic. We are to request daily bread, guidance, lead us not into temptation, deliverance from evil. Such prayers, since they use the language of we, imply intercession as well as petition. So let's use the term petition to cover both these elements, prayers for me and prayers for others. Indeed, if we were to use the Lord's Prayer as a kind of template, as C.S. Lewis suggests in his letters to Malcolm, we discover that Jesus' prayer not only includes, but actually accentuates petition. It's as though that were a main feature of our conversation with God. Obviously, Jesus did not consider supplication to be a grasping or a lesser form of communication with God, or he would not have encouraged us to ask for what is in our, on our heart when we address our Father. Moreover, the implications of his teaching is that God will act because we pray. We see this fleshed out when Jesus tells us to pray in specific situations. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray that the tribulation may not happen in winter. Pray the Lord to send out laborers into the harvest. Such prayers are to be consistent and repeated, as he suggests in the parable of the widow and the unjust judge, which he told his disciples in order to teach them that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. In the story, the widow was asking for vindication in the court case. Similarly, our prayers are to effect a change, not simply to say yes to a future that God has already decreed. Now, of course, all of this is a great mystery. How can it be that the sovereign, wise, and good God of all asks for our requests? In terms of logic, it makes no sense. Indeed, it can be ridiculed. I remember about 25 years ago, attending a service in the Anglican Cathedral of Vancouver, where the homilist spoke in dismissive terms, suggesting that those who made specific petitions were believing in a kind of magic. He told a ridiculous story about a man on a ferry with a chicken in a bag, and I don't remember how it goes. But I do remember that the story was intended to rid his parishioners of the ridiculous and naive idea that our prayers make any mark whatsoever on God's actions. The suggestion was that this mode of prayer is sub-Christian and dishonoring to the creator. And everyone laughed at his story. But I am sad that some impressionable members might have been taught by it not to pray for specifics. No. Supplication is not to be ridiculed since Jesus taught it. Certainly, we've all experienced the practices and the teachings about prayer that we are open, that we might be open to, that, that we, we've experienced practices and teachings about prayer that are open to this charge of prayer as magic. There's sort of the name it and claim it movement as part of the prosperity gospel, for example. There is the cruel assertion of some well-meaning Christians, that prayers for healing are not answered because of the person's lack of faith. No, prayer is not magic. Yet there are those who use prayer as though it were a mere talisman or a means to an end. Mottos like the family that prays together stays together have their purpose, but they are prone to demoting prayer to an action that we perform for an ulterior motive. The purpose of prayer is not to keep the family together, though it may do that. No, prayer is talking to God and listening to him. And a conversation with God is unlike any other conversation that we might have, for God is, as the theologians remind us, totally other, totally other than anything or anyone else. Yet he's made us in his image and has called those of us who are in Christ friends rather than merely servants. And so we're commanded to pray on behalf of ourselves and others. We began the discussion this morning with 
uh, first, uh, or, or actually last night, with First Timothy's command that we pray for those in authority, even for non-Christians. And so Christians routinely and rightly pray for those national presidents and prime ministers who know little, if anything, of God's will. And there are other instructions about prayer spread throughout the New Testament. The letter to the Ephesians speaks about the necessity to pray at all times and highlights supplication for all the holy ones by watchful and persevering prayer in the spirit. The epistle of James likewise enjoins us, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And James says outright, the prayer of a righteous person has great power to be effective. And then James's letter gives an illustration from the Old Testament about Elijah, a man of like nature with ourselves, who prayed that rain might cease and then that it might resume and was graced by God in receiving what he asked for. Conversation between a friend of God and God is powerful. God gives us the honor of working together with him. Petition and intercession come in different forms. Some prayer is, so to speak, in-house, praying on behalf of other Christians and for their physical and spiritual well-being. Jesus himself promises that God cares about such matters and assures those who may doubt this that when he says, um, Will not God not vindicate his elect to cry to him day and night? Will he delight, lay long over them? I tell you, he will vindicate them speedily. This is in Luke chapter 18. Now, the story in that passage that he's just told was about an unjust judge who is unlike God. Even the judge who is not righteous and who has to be cajoled will ultimately respond to repeated requests. In contrast, our God is completely concerned with justice, for righteousness is one of his names, and he will respond at just the right time. We can be assured that this will happen despite all appearances, martyrdoms, persecutions, COVID, other illnesses, despite all these appearances to the contrary. And we are to pray for it too, not just to assume that God will do his thing. Other prayers are for those, of course, outside our walls, for all humankind. But why? Why prayer? Well, why the creation of human beings? Does God have needs, such as the need to create for the sake of company? No. He is self-sufficient, a completely whole Godhead of divine persons in communion, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet it is in God's nature to create, Creation may be seen as the deliberate spilling over of his sufficiency, resulting in the marvelous world in which we live, a world that includes human beings who are, to the astonishment of the angels, bridge creatures between the other animals and God. He was pleased to make us in his own image, custodians over and members of the physical world, but privy to the secrets of the spiritual world. Indeed, though we naturally divide the spiritual realm from the physical, we're told that Christ aims to reconcile all things, whether earthly or heavenly, in himself, Colossians 1. In fact, the incarnation may be seen both as a sign of this reconciliation and as the means by which God begins to perform it. God's nature is such that he came to his own despite our rejection of him. Moreover, the generosity of God is felt at least partially by all, even by those who refuse to know him. If God is generous, making his, abounti his bounty available to others, then part of our bearing the image and the likeness of God is that we do good, including praying, which is the appropriate action of rational creatures who know a loving and powerful God. Our prayers, then, are aptly or perhaps especially offered even for those who do not obey him. For in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount about prayer, Jesus tells his disciples, of course, to pray for those who persecute them. Why? So that you may be the children of your Father who is in heaven, who makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. 
We're to pray for others as an echo of the Father's care for all, knowing that, glancing back to 1 Timothy, he desires all humans to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God has not finished with this world or those who are in it. Our prayers are a potent sign of that care as we express to God what we know to be his will for those who are presently lost. There are, they, they are also a, a truthful expression. Our prayers are a truthful expression of our creaturely status. For we do not know the trajectory that anyone is on or what will motivate them to repent. Only God knows the heart. And so we direct our prayers about others to him. So in praying for those outside the community of faith, we exhibit several Christian characteristics, characteristics that we learn from God himself. First, we show God's concern and love for all of his creatures. Secondly, we honor and we honestly admit, we honor God and we honestly admit our need of God's care and wisdom and our limited power and knowledge. And finally, our hearts are enlarged. For as we pray for them, we find that it is now difficult for us to dismiss them or to despise them. After all, in our prayers, we have brought them before the one who is the lover of humankind. Looking at the larger picture, we may discern, as our initial passage of 1 Timothy suggested, that prayer acknowledges a hopeful environment for human living, even in a post-Christian world. Our prayers put us spiritually in the place of Esther, who interceded for her people, though in a pagan context. Each secular leader is of immense value to God, lovingly made in his image. That leader is also a person with very special responsibilities and considerable powers. Therefore, we pray for them not only for their own sakes, but for the sake of others who are under their power and for the sake of the domains that they govern. This final insight is not simply a practical matter that we may live a peaceful life, though that's true. It is tied up also with what the scriptures appear to teach regarding the link between earthly and spiritual powers. Without becoming superstitious, we must acknowledge that the biblical worldview assumes a situation in which things are not only what they seem to be on the surface. The power that we see wielded by earthly leaders appears to be caught up somehow into a network of powers that or who are unseen. So Ephesians reminds us that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but with spiritual powers in dark places. It seems that the notion that the nations, as the churches, have their unseen heads. In the book of Daniel, we hear about this from the lip of the lips of the glorious being who's clothed in linen, who speaks about the opposition of the prince of Persia and the aid that he received from Michael, the chief prince. Following this pattern, we can surmise that those who are in positions of authority have some connection with the spiritual powers, since they are liable to the influence or even control of demonic and lurking powers. They need our special prayers. I'm not mentioning this connection between earthly leadership and mystery in order to suggest that we ought to speculate about such matters or to be inordinately afraid. But as St. Paul remarks to the Corinthians, we are given limited insight into the dark realms. And as those enlightened by the Holy Spirit, we are not ignorant of Satan's designs. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Simple historical knowledge attests to the connection that we're drawing here. Nazism, for example, was not simply a political agenda, but it demonstrated an interest in dark mysteries. Other ideologies or anti-Christian ideologues may not exhibit this link in the same obvious way that Hitler did, but may still be vulnerable to forces that they do not understand, for they are not deliberately, some of them, under the protection of Christ. They may think that their philosophy is of human origin only, but could well be furthering a nefarious agenda of which they are unaware. C.S. Lewis, in his screw tape letters and in that hideous strength, is helpful here. The enemy does not need us to believe that he exists in order to exert power over us. Sometimes, indeed, the scorn of human beings for mystery may provide the perfect environment for a demonic agenda to take hold. 
And so our prayers for those in political power should not be perfunctory, but fervent and perpetual. This is for their sake, for the sake of whom they govern, for the sake of Christian freedom, and for society in general. In this kind of prayer, both for those in power and for those who are governed, we show that we belong to God. He truly cares about people and the societies in which they live. Jonah was reminded of this when he did not appreciate God's care for the Ninevites. The prophets show this as they prophesy not only about Israel, but about the Gentile nations. And Jesus exemplifies this when he pours his heart out to rebellious Israel like a mother desiring to protect her chick under her wings. Paul remembers this in Romans 10 when he tells us that even the secular authority is there by God's permission to punish wrongdoing. And then there is the Pentecost icon. Who is that in the doorway waiting for the apostles to leave the upper room and to preach to him with Pentecostal power? Why is a representation of the kings of the world offering their riches to Christ once they have been brought into his household? We tend to think about God's concern only for the individual or the church, but God does not, it seems, discount general characteristics of other groups in the human family. He knows the strengths and weaknesses of various tribes, peoples, and nations. Though membership in this has no bearing on our identity in Christ, it is still part of the human condition. And in the book of Revelation, we are given a glimpse of a time when God's bounty will be given as a healing to the nations and will, when leaders will bring the glory and honor of the nations into the new Jerusalem. My apologies for the American O oh, there. I forgot to change it. In the meantime, the vigor, peacefulness, and equity of the societies in which we live matters for us as Christians and for all those who are around us, especially those who are the most vulnerable. Prayer then is a hallmark of the Christian family, even, or perhaps especially when it's being offered for those outside the church, even for those who are hostile to us. We, need, we should have known this from the teaching of the master in the Sermon on the Mount. And here we enact God's providence for all. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for them who are spiteful towards you and persecute you so that you may be the children of your father who is in heaven. He makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The purest and most powerful action of love that we can give towards our enemies is to bless and pray for them. As we earnestly pray, God will change our instincts to hate such people. But we must take care that we do not offer such prayers in smugness, like the Pharisee whose prayer was not accepted. Indeed, all the good that we know and the power to do the good to which we've been called, all this is ultimately the gift of God. For we, like unbelievers, regularly exhibit unrighteousness. As W.H. Auden says, Oh, stand, stand at the window as the tears scald and start. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. By nature, then. The Father provides the sun, making it to rise, fruitfully sending the rain. By transformation, we, his children, learn to pray that he does these things and more too. This we do in full knowledge of our own failures. It is his will that we and they should not perish. Let's think, talk about praying for those in the household now. Prayer is built on the foundation of an absolutely unique God who's generous to all and who invites us to participate in this generosity when we pray for those outside the church. But our prayers for each other are important too. The letter to the Galatians speaks of this as a supremely important act. Surely then, as we have this pre present moment, let us do good things for all and especially for those or in the household of faith. The word used to refer to the moment here, kairos, since we have this present moment, is a word that refers to a precise moment in time. And Greek also has a word which refers to the ongoing movement of time that we'll talk about in a moment. 
Odd, of course, superintends all of time, but frequently in the Gospels and the Epistles, there is an emphasis put upon the time in which we now stand, the present moment, because that, as humans, is all we possess. The past flees away and the future we cannot know, but God has given to us this moment and has entered into it in his Son, who accepted our human limitations for our sake. God, however, is master both of the precise times and of the flow of history. As St. Paul puts it, when the fullness of time, chronos here, had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. For when we were without, still without strength, Paul says in Romans 5, at just the right time, kairos, Christ died for the ungodly. So we have both of these here. God then knows the whole sweep of time and himself is the supreme judge regarding how to act in the moment. We have some knowledge of the large picture shown to us in Holy Scriptures and the tradition of the church. And we may also be prompted to act at the right time. Actually, you want to um, know this correct. Never mind. Um, at, at just the right time. Uh, we're instructed to redeem the time because the days are evil in Ephesians 5. And we know that now is the acceptable time, we're told, to act in harmony with God. As Jesus told his disciples before his death, we're no longer servants but friends because we know what the Father is doing, both in the large sweep and in the precise moment. The insight of our position and of our role is not intended to make us arrogant or presumptuous, but to move us to wonder. The creator of all is including us in his love for the world. Inclusion in this love is expressed in a particularly beautiful way when we pray for each other, further strengthening the links in the household of faith. Consider what happens when one of us prays for another. The believer praying in Christ and through the Holy Spirit, brings his or her brother or sister with that person's own concerns before the Father. And here we see true communion, the Holy Trinity, the prayer, the one being prayed for, and his or her own concerns, frequently other people, are all linked with the give and the take of prayer. In the prayer, we acknowledge Christ as the head of the body, and the power of the Holy Spirit, and the beneficence of the Father, whose will it is that we should be one as the Trinity is one. Recently, I was asked to pray for someone in need by a person who had ample reason to be angry with that person who he wanted me to pray for. Indeed, the relationship was a tangled one and involved me as well. And so here were we two agreeing to pray together for a person who, person who had a compromised relationship, not only with us, but with others whom we loved. In prayer, asking for the good of this person, I found myself overwhelmed at the generosity of the friend who had asked me to pray, despite a chain of injuries catalyzed in the past by that very one who was the object of our prayers. And as I considered the matter, I was further astonished that God could use prayer to bring all of us together with our complicated histories into his healing and omniscient presence. The prayer time, for me, was a powerful icon of the unity to which God to lead us. The person at prayer then is an icon that is a good in itself, just as marriage is a good in itself, but shows forth the unity of Christ and the church. But there's more. We're called not only to be involved in personal prayer in the closet, but also we are called to pray together in small groups in twos and threes. From the Old Testament times through today, Today, God's people have prayed together in small groups, including the family and in the assembly of the whole. Of course, it's the assembly of the whole of Israel in prayer that's emphasized in the Old Testament. It seems that smaller groups of prayers were taken for granted there and thus not stressed. So we only have a few examples of prayers and of, and of pairs and of families praying together there. Eli prompts young Samuel's prayer as he comes before the Lord. Hannah desires a child in agreement with Eli. Naomi encourages Ruth to bless the true God of Israel and to hope for the response of Boaz. Job consecrates his sons with prayer every morning. 
Tobias and Sarah going into the Apocrypha to pray a righteous and faithful prayer for protection as they come to marriage. In Esther, Mordecai and Esther pray matching prayers regarding the safety of the Jewish people, at least in the extended Esther story. We see in the wisdom books the mediating of um, a father instructing his son in Proverbs, the mother's care for her family, the unity of brothers, and so on. And frequently, Deuteronomy 11 is used, a passage that concludes with a reference to teaching the family. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall teach them to be your children, talking of them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking, um, when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, and you shall write them as doorposts upon your house and upon your gates. Family teaching and prayers are thus explicitly commanded and assumed, but the major emphasis of the Old Testament and the New is on the prayers of the whole people of God gathered around Christ. It's important to remember that the Jewish institution of the synagogue means literally the gathering together, just like the Greek word for corporate worship, the synaxis. The fathers, in discussing Jesus' teaching regarding his presence among the twos or threes gathered in his name, warned against those who were making the small groups programmatic and thus neglecting the larger assembly. There's one key episode in the Gospels where we see the two and three modeled for us. This is the astonishing episode of the transfiguration, where Jesus is literally placed in their midst. Here, the two, the stories found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Moses and Elijah, stand in as representatives of the Old Covenant, and the three, Peter, James, and John, represent the apostles of the New Covenant. They gather around Jesus who shines in their midst and who suggests a new situation in which God's people will be illumined because he himself will enact the new exodus, the new redemption. The presence of the two Old Testament and the three New Testament leaders reminds us of the reference to the law that's confirmed in the New Testament regarding how to establish the truth of a matter. By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Indeed, Jesus gives the idea of double or triple witness in a firmly theological context when he argues with his detractors and urges them to receive the truth on the witness of the fathers and the scriptures. In John 5, he says, if I bear witness to myself, my testimony is not true. Yet there is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the testimony which he bears of me is true. He sent to John and he bore witness to the truth. John was a burning and shining lamp and you were willing to rejoice for some time in his light. But the testimony which I possess is far greater than that of John for the works which the father has granted me to do, the very works which I am performing bear me witness that the father has sent me. And the father who sent me has himself borne witness to me his voice you have never heard, and his form you have never seen. Moreover, you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him who he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is these scriptures themselves that bear witness to me. And then there is also the witness of the Spirit. But when the Helper comes, Jesus says in John 15, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. It would seem then that two or three human witnesses demanded in Deuteronomy and ratified in the New Testament are intended as reflections of the plurality in unity of the true God, who can be seen in Father, in Son, and in the actions of the Holy Spirit, as well as in the human witness of the prophets and the ancient Torah. Second Peter refers to this unified experience of revelation when it enjoins Christians to hearken to the lamp of the apostles, whose word confirms and makes even more certain the words of the prophets. For we did not follow cleverly divined, uh, devised myths 
when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word made more sure. You will do well to pay attention to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. No prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. The instruction here holds together the importance of mediation and the entire body of Christ joining together the we of the apostles, the two or three, with the you of the entire community, both in terms of teaching and interpretation and in terms of direct knowledge of God. The earlier part of this chapter speaks about progression, Christian progression to full maturity, to attaining the likeness of Christ. It says that we have all that we need to become like God, including this unified witness that has been brought to us in the scripture and in the church. We've seen then that intercessory prayer, as well as mediated truth, displays the character of the church as we are invited to participate in God's generous love to all, especially experienced among his people. Scriptures don't simply command us as a law, but they mediate the words of the apostles who learned from Christ. The Bible also speaks of mediation as a kind of mystery or paradox. It shows us that God uses others, both individuals and the body, to bring each of us into an intimate relationship with him. Let's consider briefly Acts as a surprising record of mediation. Here we see that the community is actually constituted by its being gathered around the apostles and around the action of communion. We have verse 42 of chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, or I, could, I would translate this to the breaking and the prayers of the bread. It's with the apostles in their midst, for both for teaching and as the center of life in the community, that the early Christians expressed their faith and grew in it. Those who received the word were dependent upon the apostles for the witness, but the apostles were dependent upon the other believers for the constitution of the full community. And the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread, is a picture of such interdependence. Wine and bread made by human hands, blessed in the assembly and used by God to communicate his saving presence among them. Indeed, it makes present the very work of Jesus done on the cross in the past and points to the future, to that great wedding banquet on the last day in which we will all rejoice in the bridegroom's presence. It's not simply that the early Christians met together to get recharged for the work of being the church. No, it was something they gave themselves to. Being the church meant gathering around the apostles Centering instruction, uh, 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 centering instruction and fellowship around those who've been with Jesus physically, breaking bread and praying with them as Jesus had taught his disciples on that crucial night. Mediation of one to another is in the essence of the body, and by it, Jesus becomes present with us all and with each. Along with positive descriptions of the early followers, the Acts is frank in offering pictures of those whose faith was misguided. Consider the complex case of Simon in Acts 8, that magician from Samaria who was baptized and joined the Christian community. He thought of healing and miracles as a means to an end, though, the end being his own prowess and power. And in the story, we see the importance both of mediation and unmediated access to God. The deacon Philip has traveled from Jerusalem to preach in Samaria, and there he has astounded many with his acts of healing so that they put away their magical paraphernalia and they are baptized. Even Simon, who was a magician and a celebrity in his country, follows the wave and believes. However, the presence of the apostles was necessary, it seems, for these new Samaritan converts to come to the fullness of the faith and to receive the Holy Spirit. 
For it's not until Peter and John join Philip and lay hands upon the newly baptized that this gift is given, issuing in a kind of parallel day of Pentecost for the converts from this half-breed and despised nation. They are now one body with the believers in Jerusalem. Simon, however, is so taken with the phenomena accompanying the spirit that he covets the power of John and Jane and Peter, and he offers money to have the same gift. And it's from this episode that we name the sin of simony, the desire to buy prestige or power in the church. The first thing that we may note is that Simon evidently received baptism only formally or for dubious reasons, perhaps because he was staggered by Philip's healing abilities not because of Jesus and the good news about him. So then we have an implicit lesson. Baptism isn't automatic. It's not an automatic route to salvation, but must be accompanied by faith. And in the case of infants, those of us who are not Anabaptists would say that the faith must follow afterwards, being expressed in ongoing repentance so far as the child is able, or it, it is not a fulfilled baptism. Mediation. Mediated membership, then, is insufficient for the true Christian life, but it is part of the whole. Peter's response to Simon when he asked to buy the Spirit and Simon's response to Peter help us to see this. The apostle explains that Simon's heart is not sound and calls on him to pray in repentance. Simon, apparently uncertain of his own status before God asked for Peter to pray. And in this interchange, we see an emphasis both on immediate and the mediated. Perhaps Simon only wants Peter to pray so that he can escape punishment. Peter wants more for him, repentance that leads to full inclusion and the ability of Simon himself to pray among the people of God. The personal and the corporate, the immediate and the mediated are to go together. Simon had no interest in joining the body of Christ, it seems, but in continuing in his accustomed status within a new community and Luke doesn't tell us how this story ends, but he does finish the story of Saul's or Paul's conversion. The story is so important, it's told three times in Acts. What is particularly striking to me about the first telling of the story is that Saul, the one who saw the great light of Christ, is sent off for instruction at the hands of Ananias and the other Christians in Damascus. Augustine, in fact, makes this very point when he's talking about pride and about how the church should show love as its major characteristic. In his tome on doctrine, he beautifully describes our life together in section six. Let us consider the fact that the apostle Paul himself, although admonished by the voice of God, was yet sent to a man who to be admitted into the church. The condition of our race would have been much more degraded if God had not chosen to make use of human beings as the minister of his word to their fellow men. Moreover, love itself, which binds us together, would have no means of pouring soul into soul and, as it were, mingling them one another, one with the other, if men had never learned anything from their fellow men. So the interconnection and mediation for each other is absolutely significant for our bond of love. St. Paul the Pharisee had to humble himself before Ananias. He learned and passed on a family way. What do you have that you did not receive? He asked the Corinthians. Our reception of God's truth, our communion with him, is not something to boast over, but something about which we are grateful. Our reception of God's riches through other human beings is a wonderful antidote to pride. But it also shows the elevated status of the sons, the children of men, because of Jesus' incarnation. And it's an emblem of the divine love that we share. The new covenant then overturns our expectations while it also maintains significant continuity with the old covenant. Let us recall that glorious prayer of Holy Mary, who thanked God for coming to our aid and who also said he has scattered the proud, and the imagination of their hearts, and lift it up, the humble and meek. Mediation continues in the church, but sometimes the mediation goes in the opposite direction that we expected, since the Lord inhabits each and all of his people, whether of high or low degree, by human standards.
camera over to me for a second, Carl. Just waiting for the camera to show up this way. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Humphreys, for opening this up for us and for expanding our imagination around what is happening in prayer and to see prayer as a practice of mediation um, and that moves in all these ways. I, I, thank you very much. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, we, uh, you are welcome to, uh, on Zoom, indicate uh, that uh, you have a question. And Carl Coop, who's the co-host, uh, will map, pay attention to that. You can either indicate with your hands, I think, possibly, if your screens are on, which would be good, or if you uh, want to put a question in chat. Um, let's, um, let's take a few minutes um, for questions, keep your questions short, and if you could introduce yourself as well uh, before you um, ask your question so we, we know a little bit of who you are. What are your questions? I have John Bupalin in the class. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Humphrey, thank you. Am I audible? You can hear my question. I yes. can hear you. Fantastic, thank you. I really Now I can see you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you again. Uh, John Bupalin, I teach in the Department of Biblical theological studies here at CMU. I really appreciated the specificity of uh, your lecture. Uh, uh, I have one comment which I will not make. If there's time, I might return to that, but I really am interested in that comment, but I'll bracket that for now. So my question is about the specificity of prayer itself, right? As you detail the many characteristics of prayer, many things stood out to me. So for instance, uh, enemy love, or confession, as in James, or is it the focus on the most vulnerable? Is it remembrance, as in the Deuteronomy text, or even in the social practice of having the phylacteries in the Jewish tradition? Is it uh, this investment in social power, as opposed to the story of Simon and the Acts of the Apostles? So my question is this, right, is about the specificity of prayer, uh, when I hear you describe these characteristics, I can see that there are some parallels in other religious traditions as well. So if I were to ask the question, what is the most distinctive characteristic uh, in Christian specificity around prayer, what would you say? <laughs> I would say it includes an, two things that kind of are intention, that we acknowledge that God is all powerful and that it's possible for us not to pray um, according to his will, but also that God is all loving and invites um, our deep felt heart longings. And we keep these two things together in tension. Unless we're given a direct word from God about how to pray for something, we pray what is in our heart, but also with an openness that he may have another answer than the one that we are, um, that we are, um, um, that we are asking for. And the reason why I think that that is specifically Christian is because it holds together the, our, 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 our belief that God has, by the incarnation, honored humanity, but still remains God and we are not. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another question? I don't know if that's a question in the chat, Carl. Not yet. I... Um, uh, this is Carl Coop here. I teach in the area of biblical theological uh, studies. Um, my question has to do with uh, how prayers are addressed. So in the Western tradition and often in evangelical traditions, uh, Jesus is very much at the center, is named in prayer. Um, in, in more Eastern traditions, uh, prayers tend to be more Trinitarian. This is also true. Uh, that is it is the Trinity to which the prayer is addressed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So uh, I'm wondering whether you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, in evangelical traditions, it's, it's often very, very Christological or 
-hmm. the prayers may be addressed to Jesus, mm -hmm. to a, a, an individual within the, the Godhead, right? One of, mm -hmm. the, one of the persons of the Trinity. So mm -hmm. talk, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Is it Dr. Coop? Sure. Yes, okay. So, so Dr. Coop, actually, it's not the case that Orthodox don't pray directly to Jesus. And in fact, one of our most common prayers is that a prayer with which we begin every personal prayer time and every service, and it's a prayer addressed to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Heavenly King, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide within us and heal our sins and save us, O oh good one. So that the, the, the prayers to directly to Jesus and prayers to the Holy Spirit, um, prayers directly to Jesus are no stranger in the Orthodox communion. No. And our liturgies and our personal prayers are full of them, okay? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and prayers to the Holy Spirit, I think, are more dominant in Orthodoxy than they are in the Western Church, and I think for a theological reason. So, but... We, when we are addressing Jesus or addressing the Holy Spirit, we always have in the back of our minds their communion with the Holy Trinity. And so the Father is there and um, the Son is there when we're addressing the Spirit and so on. And so normatively, anything, uh, anything that is formally done is done in the name of the Holy Spirit. Like, for example, baptism. And if someone were coming from outside of the Orthodox community into to become Orthodox. Um, generally speaking, their, their baptism is not done again. They're simply chrismated. But if they were baptized, for example, in a Pentecostal Jesus only movement, they would be baptized because we don't consider that that is adequate. So um, it, yes, we have the framework of the Holy Trinity and we mention the Holy Trinity so many more times than Western worship, worship is prone to. It seems sort of with Western worship, you get it at the baptism and you get it a few places in the, in the Eucharist, if it's a Eucharistic yeah. community, but, but not nearly as often as we do. But we also have explicit, lovely prayers uh, to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. Uh, I'm also uh, aware the epiclesis, right, at, at the Eucharist, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a difference, a distinction from the Western Church. Um, uh, so this is, this is very, very helpful. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering whether the Western Church could be uh, a bit more instructed uh, or uh, learn something from from this, but I'll leave, I'll leave it at yeah, that. I, I, just as a, as a kind of a, um, a personal experience, I remember after, after having been um, in the Orthodox Church for some time, being asked to go and speak at a, at a United Church um, in, the, in their service, they did not mention the Trinity once. Not once. And I, I just, it, I felt like, like, I felt like we had, sat down for a meal but not had the main course it just felt so strange when you're used to <laughs> conceiving always of the right. triune god and i and i do think frankly that um political correctness and fear over over masculine language for god has become part of why folks yeah. are now speaking to jesus because it's a name and they don't speak very often of the son or of the father yeah uh, i think that's part of what's happening here and we're losing a characteristic of who it is that we are. In my yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I would say that the uh, Mennonites have lost a uh, sense of uh, a Trinitarian understanding. I think when I was growing up, uh, the worship services definitely began in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But there's less attentiveness to, to that, to naming that at the beginning of a service, um, mm -hmm. I think, in our time. So. And, and more conservative churches um, won't want to change the Trinitarian name, but it's easier just to drop it and not to be offensive. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there uh, one more question? Either uh, folks on Zoom or folks in class, do you, is there another question that you're pressing to ask it before we close? Greg has a question. Greg has a question. Thank you, Greg. Hi, I hope you can hear me. I don't think I can turn my camera on. I can um, hear you fine. Great. Uh, thanks, Edith, for your lectures today and, and uh, yesterday evening. Um, 
I want to ask a question. Uh, well, maybe I'll first say that uh, when I was doing my, when I was into my doctoral research in earnest, I had to think a lot about mediation and it would have been very helpful to have a book. Uh, it would have been very helpful to have a book on mediation, um, you know, such as the one that you're, you're completing now. So I'm, I'm very thankful that you're doing this work. Um, I want to ask a question about uh, if you've given explicit attention or thought um, to hierarchy. And I guess the context for the question is, um, well, I see, you know, these threads running all through your lectures. And so I'm wondering if you're giving an explicit attention. But let's say something like, uh, you know, Dionysius the Areopagite and his celestial hierarchy uh, and as it overlays with uh, the ecclesi uh, ecclesiastical hierarchy. So thinking about the angels, you know, one part of it is mediation, right? How do you represent below? How do you represent to humanity that which is divine, right? But part of the answer is exactly that those who are the angels who are closest to God pass it down to those who are a little further away and below them. Right. And so the notion of mediation and hierarchy are very, are, you know, seem very intertwined. And I think there's lots of threads. Like I could go through your lectures and point out all the places where I see it. But I wonder if I wonder if you give it explicit attention in this, in this body of research. So the, the answer is yes, although I've given it more explicit attention elsewhere. But your question now is prompting me to maybe beef up that section some. And what I say in scripture and tradition is that we see both a hierarchy and a mediation in the Christian tradition. By the way, we see that also, um, I, I deal with it quite, quite explicitly in Ecstasy and Intimacy, my book on, um, on human spirituality. And that um, if you don't like the word hierarchy or be, because it's close to patriarchy and it just ruffles feathers, then just think about divine ordering that there is an order to things. The interesting thing though, though is that even while the divine order or hierarchy um, is normative in the way that um, scriptures see reality and in the way that the tradition has interpreted it, both in the, in the church and in the world in general, um, it's not a kind of a, uh, a chain of being such as we might find in some medieval writings, which doesn't permit the, the a lower link to have a um, to have a significant um, participation in that reality. So we can see a little bit of this, for example, in that very infamous passage in First Corinthians eleven, where Paul speaks about um, how women should cover their heads during worship. And he says, because of the angels, that implies a kind of order. He also says, because the son is not ashamed to call the father his head. And yet earlier in 1 Corinthians, he's made it very clear that in 1 Corinthians 8, that Jesus is the Lord and to be worshipped alongside the father. So, there is a mutuality even while there is um, a, a normative hierarchy. And sometimes that means that God can surprise us. And so in the Pauline letters, I believe it's in Colossians, though I can't give you chapter and verse right now, Paul speaks about how human beings witness to the angels about the incarnation. And that makes sense because that's our bailiwick. He became human being. He did not, did not become an angel. So when I, 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 I am um, loath to be, because um, uh, because of of the experiences that I've had and because of my um, my my desire to be faithful to the scriptures and the traditions. I'm loath to get rid of the idea of hierarchy. I think it's absolutely essential that we think in terms of order. Um, it, where God doesn't have reality as a bungalow, but more like a kind of a castle. On the other hand, sometimes there are real surprises and someone in the dungeon can go into the castle and do something very significant. And so um, there's this mutuality, even in the Trinity, that we see all three are equally God. Each one of them glorifies the other. And yet the spirit does not um, 
make the father proceed from him and the son does not beget the father. So there's Mm. even in the Holy Trinity, both a hierarchy and a mutuality. So Mm. that would be my take. And that's what I, that's what I would stress. Thanks. Okay. I, I can see the wheels of Greg's mind turning, <laughs> even though we don't have his video. I'm, I'm nodding vigorously over here. <laughs> we have uh, a, we have a, can I, can, I know we, I know we need to close. I just have a delightful story. So unless you think that the, uh, that the Orthodox church is hopelessly hierarchical, there's a story and I hear it's true about a bishop who went to visit um, one of his uh, parishes um, in, in the North, probably the Arctic. And or in Alaska, I suspect. And um, he led the, the divine liturgy and he preached at the end, as sometimes happens rather than after the gospel. And then after he preached, he, he turned to the, the priest of the parish and he said, you know, I'd be happy to take questions if your people have questions. So they started to ask very basic questions like, who was Jesus Christ? Whose son is he? And tell us about the cross and so on and so forth. And finally, the bishop looked to the priest and said, I don't mean to be disrespectful, Father, but it looks, it looks to me as though your people are not very well acquainted with orthodoxy. And like this, the priest shot back, oh, no, your eminence, my people are very well acquainted with orthodoxy, but they want to make sure that you are, because if you're not, you cannot be their bishop. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's a top down, but there's also a bottom up authority, in, at, at least potentially in our church. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. OK, um, thanks, everyone, for coming and for joining us. Um, uh, uh, this morning, we have uh, another one last lecture this evening at seven o'clock, and you're welcome to come. It's all on Zoom. Uh, uh, it's entitled Mediation Matriarchs in the Communion of Saints. It sounds like a good community going there. And, uh, and so we'll gather again. Um, thanks again for the stimulating conversation. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure we'll have lots of conversations that will follow.